Curious what your thoughts are as we've all been looking for new vaccines, new medicines, and yet at least today it looks like a study showing that an old generic 60-year-old drug could be promising from early results. Does that give you at least some comfort here? Yeah, uh, it surely does. And if you're a doctor on the front lines, you've got to work with the tools you have, not with the tools you wish you had, not with a vaccine that may or may not appear, What? not with a drug that may or may not appear. And so what's been happening, and it's very encouraging to see around the world, is that there are a number of advances that have dramatically reduced death. This is, I count, uh, the fourth in a series. The first one is really simple. You flip people over on their stomach instead of keeping on their back all the time. Turns out that allows the deep lungs to get more air. That saved a lot of lives. Second, people found that if you use anticoagulants, one of the really amazing discoveries of this infection is late in the disease course, it inflames your blood vessels and that can trigger blood clots, massive blood clots all over your body. So yeah, judicious use of blood clots has had a very dramatic effect on reducing uh, death. There was a drug cocktail that uh, was put together in Hong Kong based on their experience with SARS and MERS using, again, off-the-shelf drugs. Anticoagulants are off-the-shelf. These drugs that were used in Hong Kong, uh, interferon beta and uh, ribavirin, are also unpatented. They're off-patent. They've been used for a long time. Make a big difference. The drug that does it, and now dexamethasone, added to all of that. The mm -hmm. drug that doesn't make a difference to survival is the one everybody's running around about, remdesivir. <laughs> Studies show it makes absolutely no difference if you're really sick to your outcome. However, it's really encouraging that we have tools at hand that make a big difference. And I'll tell you how big a difference. If you went into an ICU unit and needed breathing support through an intubation at the beginning of the epidemic, you had about a 90 to 80% chance of dying, 80 to 90% chance of dying. Today, you have an 80% chance of living. It's a big advance. Wow. That really does put into the context of how important generic drugs the, the, under our noses can perform. But, Doctor, what about the hope for some sort of silver bullet, some sort of vaccine that might prevent not only the disease ripening within people, but hopefully even stopping the spread. Are you hopeful for that in the next 12 to 18 months as it stands? Well, we all like the handicap thing. So I would say I'm pretty sure, based on my own work and what I see around, that and I would give it a 90 percent chance mm -hmm. that we're going to have drugs that will prevent people who are infected from getting sick. And those self-same drugs will prevent those who are exposed from being infected. And I'd give that a 90% chance within a year, year and a half at most. Uh, I would give vaccines at this point where we know very early, it's like judging a horse race when the gates have just opened, mm -hmm. I give it a 50-50 chance. We don't know yet, we don't know enough. We know enough to be worried, but we have some encouraging results. So we're in an intermediate phase, it's a little too early to call. But as far as the drugs that are going to be able to really treat this disease, and these won't be off-the-shelf drugs. These will be brand-new drugs directed specifically for the virus. And we can look forward over time to a single shot that will prevent you from being infected for months. Uh, that's just happened for HIV-AIDS, and I'm sure we can do it for this virus, too. So, doctor, if we do get to that stage or when we get to that stage, is this the type of vaccine, this is the type of drug uh, that would have to sort of be revisited or updated on a yearly basis in the way that we see other uh, types of vaccines like the annual flu shots and things like that? Or is this just going to be kind of a one shot deal? No pun intended. I think it would be a, it, it doesn't look at this point like it'll be a one shot deal. Mm. It looks like a vaccine. And I'm going to make a distinction between two kinds of drugs. There are vaccines that your body makes an immune reaction to, and you therefore have some degree of protection. It doesn't look at this early stage, and I emphasize early stage, that it's going to last very long. So you'll probably need boosters, or you'll need another shot. The drugs, on the other hand, by their very nature, will at this point only last a certain amount of time. Now, if they're easy to take, like a pill, you could take those for a very long time. You know, if you're in an endemic malaria area, you can take those pills pretty often, and you can take them for a long time. You can take them if you're just a tourist, or you can take them if you live there. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. 
or a long-acting shot. So you just have one shot, it lasts two or three months. I developed an antibody for anthrax. You give it to people and they're protected for one to two months from anthrax infections. So those are the kinds of things that we're developing. As I say, I'm pretty sure we're going to have the drug half of that, 50% sure we're going to have the vaccine as part of that. Doctor, we were getting some headlines out today that Beijing has closed its schools as they are now seeking, seeing a second wave of infections. Curious your thoughts on a second wave and if maybe with some of these vaccines, if it gets, gives us the disease, our bodies can learn to fight it as long as it prevents the most severe symptoms, then that helps herd immunity and helps us to recover from this faster. How are you thinking about a second wave, schools reopening, herd immunity? Those are a bunch of questions all rolled into one, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to take them apart. First of all, what's happening in China, in, in Beijing specifically? For the last six weeks, they've had no cases. All of a sudden, a few cases popped up. And that is what we can expect in the most successful public health measures to contain this disease. No cases for a long time, sporadic cases. Do everything you can to control it before it spreads. And I'm pretty sure they're going to do that. That's what you can do without a vaccine or without a drug. And they're doing it, and they're doing it effectively. It, we should be lucky to get there. Rather than zero cases for six weeks, we've had over 20,000 cases a day for more than two and a half months. And we still have 20,000 cases a day for two and a half months. So we're very far from where we'd like to be. Now, the next question you asked is, is there such a thing as herd immunity? I don't think it exists for coronaviruses. Mm. The way we reason, and the reason we think that, is that a long time ago, coronaviruses got into the human population, and every year, the self-same viruses come back again and again and again, infecting the very same people and giving them the very same thing. When I look deep into this virus, and I'm learning more about it all the time, this is a very complex virus. And it has at least 20 tools at its disposal to change our immune system in its favor. And part of that change is to say, OK, get rid of me today, but I'm going to come back tomorrow. That's how it evolved. It's cracking our immune system's code. It cracked it a long time ago. It knows how to do that. And these viruses are very likely to come back. So that's why it's going to be harder to vaccine, not a slam dunk. And it's why. This is going to be around for a long time. There is no herd immunity for the current generations of cold viruses mm -hmm. that infected us for decades and longer.